Oh, oh yeah, all kinds of yeah. opioids. Yeah, I mean, Erie County, New York is one of the worst ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't, you know, she spent a month, so she just recently. efforts here have been remarkable. I mean, not just John, but it's, I mean, the state of California got $90 million from the 21st Century Cures bill that Obama uh, signed right before he left office. Mm -hmm. Put a whole bunch of money into medication treatment for opioids. Right. And California got $90 million, and they're putting the whole thing into Vermont's public spoke model. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout California, so I'm sort of helping through my UCLA um, deal, and uh, oh my god, I mean, talk about a huge job to try to yeah. promote primary treatment and primary care, uh, I mean, because that's really the, I mean, that's the, the, that's the bottom the line yeah, of what this is all about, right? Um, it's, it's, there's a huge need. North, Northern California, above Sacramento, has almost no medication. There's no methadone clinics, and there's no very few providers, so it's, it's a real challenge. Yeah, and she's fine. There's some problems there. I mean, they have to try to Yeah, she's starting. Yeah, right. Oh, I know. It's, yeah. Anyway, oh, good. <laughs> How are you, Beth? I'm very well. How are you? Good. Thank you for all this great work. Yes, well, it's, uh, it's been fun. Actually, writing the report was fun. But <laughs> the interview was, done. Uh, was, yeah, it was, was very done. fun. Yeah. Yeah. That was really quite, it was like, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to hear yeah. it. That's so good to hear it. No, I mean, it's <laughs> your average substance use. They were professional study volunteers. So yeah, so yeah. Yeah. And, and so the 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 companies are really Okay, great to meet you. Great to meet you. Thank you. So I don't know, but I mean, really, it was. Uh, and I mean, I did all the interviews except for about 20 of my colleagues who I worked with for 40 years. Sitting on so much sort of a rich sense of it. Yeah. Uh, anthropological. No, I mean, when you talk to these patients, and you know, they're so important. You're also looking at them, and you're listening to how they're talking, and you're kind of thinking they're doing well. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, it's not like they're sitting there nodding off. Yeah, I mean, they're doing That's no, I, I, no, literally. I mean, I, I heard, I heard that. I mean, uh, George Bill, who was my primary care guy. He's he's been really. Right, John and John Dickens, he was, uh, George said, 
Okay, I'd like to get started so we can give Dr. Rosson the full amount of time for today's lecture. All right, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Rawson. He's a research professor here at the uh, UVM Center for, uh, the Vermont Center for Behavior and Health in the Department of Psychiatry. And he's an emeritus professor from the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He's been with us since about 2015. And uh, before that, uh, actually he's returned to us. He earned his PhD in experimental psychology from UVM in 1974. Um, Dr. Rawson spent his career uh, conducting research, providing training on innovative behavioral and medication treatments for addictions, and he just completed an evaluation of the Vermont Hub and Spoke Opioid Addiction Treatment System. And he's the principal investigator of a grant from the California Department of Health Services to export the Vermont Hub and Spoke model to California. Um, I'm going to read the next section, which I have been doing, just so I, I don't uh, get uh, miss anything so you can uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Rawson's career. He's led addiction research and training projects for the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and the U.S. State Department, exporting science-based knowledge to many parts of the world. He's contributed to the development of evidence-based addiction treatment in uh, Vietnam, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Iraq, and other countries. Dr. Rawson has published three books, 40 chapters, over 220 peer-reviewed articles, and has conducted over 1,000 uh, paper, uh, workshop paper presentations and training sessions. So this is probably not a big deal to him. Uh, we're very appreciative to have Dr. Rawson on our faculty and excited to hear from him today about, about his work. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Julie. Uh, hi. Uh, happy Groundhog Day. It's, uh, this whole experience of coming back to UVM is sort of a Groundhog Day experience for me. When I was a kid and they said that the, you know, the groundhog would come up and if he, he saw a shadow, you'd get six more weeks of winter. I thought that was a good thing because I, it's like, oh yeah, of course there's going to be six. It's like likely to be 12 more weeks of winter, but six would be great. But um, anyway, um, I'm going to talk about a uh, labor of love that I uh, have done for the last couple of years here in Vermont. When I got back in 2015, um, Steve Higgins and Bob Parentini invited me to come to uh, UVM to talk about what was going on in Vermont and whether or not I could do anything useful here. And so we talked about, um, uh, Steve offered me a position at the Vermont Center of Behavior and Health, and um, Bob was very supportive. I met with uh, the, the folks doing the work in the Day One program and Sanchip Maruti and others, and then went down and met with the Department of Health people, and Beth Tansman was there, and Barbara Simaglio, and Harry uh, Chan, and we uh, talked about what might be useful for Vermont in the way of blending UVM researchy kinds of skills with the needs of the uh, State Department of Health. They, I heard about the data that Beth uh, and, and the Blueprint folks had collected on uh, the cost offset, the data that is available and it's been published on the hub and spoke system. I learned about the um, data that Ann Van Donsel and Department of Health has on the evaluation and the, or on the collection of the data on things like retention and treatment and how many patients and the characteristics of the patients. And my question was, what do the patients think of this? What are, I mean, we've got, a, we've got a lot of good data, but has there been any systematic collection of data from, directly from the patients about their experience? 
And so in, uh, with support from, again, Steve, as well as from uh, the Department of Health, we talked about the development of an evaluation of the hub and spoke. I gave Barbara a budget for a prospective, randomized evaluation of the hub and spoke of uh, about $2 million. And Barbara said, yeah, that would be a great study, but uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and so we, we designed something a little different. Uh, clearly what's needed to be done is a prospective study where you start with patients as they go into the system, follow them over time, and uh, look at it as an intent to treat kind of model. That wasn't possible. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about essentially is would be very good data as a pilot for a much larger study, but I do think it gives us some perspective on how well are people doing in this treatment uh, system, and what are, the, what are the things that they think are useful, and what could we be doing better? So that's the perspective on this, uh, on, on this data that I'm gonna present to you. And it was funded by, um, Grants through the Department of Health, they have a CDC grant and part of their block grant funding were used to fund this uh, project. So uh, the first thing I learned when I got back here in 2015 was I learned about the New England heroin ep epidemic. Uh, this kind of heroin use is not going on in California. It's, it's obviously increasing in California, but my experience in UCLA, we were still doing a lot of treatment with cocaine and methamphetamine users and seeing a lot of prescription opioids, but it was nothing like I experienced when I came back to Vermont. I mean, this is uh, in my wandering around the world doing work on treatment systems, I think only Iran has a problem that is as severe where the rates of use are as high as they are in Vermont. Iran has had centuries of, of opioid addiction and has probably seven to eight percent of the adult population in Iran are opioid users. And we've done some work with them with methadone and buprenorphine. But um, Vermont's probably pretty close. We've tried to collect some data on exactly what we think the epidemiology is here in Vermont. And, it, and the best guess is that somewhere in the neighborhood of 3 to 4% of the population in Vermont are uh, regularly using opioids, either prescription opioids or heroin and fentanyl now. That's a very high rate. Our historical number we always used to, to describe the heroin rate in the U.S. was about half of 1%. So 3 to 4% is, is, you know, magnitudes much higher. So Vermont responded. I, I had a history when I was at UCLA of dealing with Vermont when, when Governor Dean was uh, uh, governor. He and I had a long-running uh, email relationship about why Vermont didn't have methadone. And uh, this was in the late 90s and early 2000s, and uh, I obviously never got anywhere with him, but uh, starting in the early 2000s with work uh, done by uh, some of the folks here at UVM, John Brooklyn and Steve Higgins and uh, Warren Bickel, buprenorphine was uh, introduced into the state of Vermont. It was one of the, more, one of the earlier places where buprenorphine was uh, made available. And over the next 15 years, Again, through the efforts of these folks, uh, many doctors in Vermont have become buprenorphine prescribers. Vermont has almost twice as many per capita buprenorphine prescribers as in most other states. Certainly in California, it's about three times higher than in, uh, and in this project I'm doing in California. It's really hard to get this going because there's so few prescribers. Uh, so. Vermont's done a wonderful job of getting their physicians certified to do buprenorphine and educated to treat addiction. This was put into a structure, started in around 2010, and really went into place in 2013. It's called the hub and spoke system. I'm not gonna do a lot of description of it, but it involves increasing access to medication-assisted treatment. I'm also not gonna do a lot of background on the uh, evidence for the support for, for medication-assisted treatment. Let me just say, every health organization, including the United Nations and the World Health Organization, 
has supported, and the, current, the recent Surgeon General's report in, in November of uh, last year, have all documented medication-assisted treatment as by far having the strongest evidence for the treatment of opioid dependence. So I think the leadership here, uh, Blueprint for Health, the Department of Health, when they decided how to respond to the opioid epidemic by expanding medication-assisted treatment, followed the science. And I think that's something to their credit. The way they've done it, uh, structured it, is by uh, setting up uh, through this, uh, uh, the Vermont waiver, they set up this hub and spoke system and they divided the state into regions. There's now six regions actually uh, in Vermont. Um, each region has a hub, more or less. Um, they, the, a hub is a clinic that ha is licensed to provide methadone treatment. Um, it's staffed with, to provide intensive treatment. Patients often going in daily for their medication and behavioral treatment and monitoring. Uh, they also provide suboxone treatment out of those uh, hub clinics. Um, and that's, that's been a real uh, addition. I mean, about half of the people receiving medication-assisted treatment in Vermont are receiving it in these hub clinics. Here in Chittenden County, the Howard Center um, Chittenden Clinics in, uh, are the, the two pieces of the hub here in, in this region. The thing, though, that when I talk to the rest of the world about the hub and spoke, the thing that's different, the thing that Vermont has done that hasn't been done anywhere else, is the integration of medication-assisted treatment into primary care, the spokes. The spokes are what makes Vermont different from there, there are other places where Suboxone is being used in primary care. Massachusetts at Harvard and Mass General and a lot of BU and a lot of those places. But they're mostly in research settings. There are not a lot of places where this is routine, the way it's become in Vermont. And so uh, this, is, this was the thing that was most remarkable to me when I went out and started just wandering around the state talking to patients and doctors and family members before I started the study was, holy mackerel, this is different than anything I've ever seen before. These uh, doctors and their staffs are treating these people for opioid addiction just like it's a regular chronic disease that they treat in their clinics. Wow, that's pretty cool. So anyway, these spokes, as I mumbled about, are um, primary care practices mostly. There's a few exceptions that are some mental health clinics, but um, they're primarily, uh, and they're scattered all over the state of Vermont. I believe there's something like 80 to 90 of the primary care offices that are the spokes. The spokes interact with the hub. If the spokes have patients that are too difficult, who need more monitoring, they can be referred to the hubs. If the hubs induct a patient into suboxone treatment, and the patient's doing well, and they want to be transferred to a clinic nearer to their home or work, they transfer to the spoke. And there's an interaction back and forth that's very flexible and very uh, much set up to meet the needs of the patient. And the hubs have uh, intensive treatment staff that are you know, drug counselors and addiction trained physicians and nurses who have expertise in addiction, they really have, they're really little centers of excellence for uh, addiction care. And I have to say, even though the hubs are, you know, if you walked into them, you'd say, oh, you know, it's like methadone clinics. I mean, that's, it's not like, it, it's very different than in California. In California, they have your basic methadone clinic where that's all they do is methadone treatment. And the doctor's only role is to sign methadone orders. Here in Vermont, the physicians are much more involved in the, in the treatment, in the hubs, and certainly in the spokes. That's something that's very different. I mean, if you think about the culture of addiction treatment, it's always been, or historically has always been, much more about counseling stuff happening, a variety of... In, in this model, we see the physician and, more recently, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants playing a central role in the treatment. And that came through in spades in the, in the data that I'm gonna talk about, the qualitative data, is that the, 
the dynamic for many of these patients is about their relationship with their doctor. Everything else is nice. Even the medicine gets rated as less important than the relationship they have with their physician. And that's different. We've never seen that before. In the spokes, we have buprenorphine prescribing physicians who are supported by a medication-assisted treatment team, MAT team. Those folks are provided through the Blueprint for Health, and they're placed into these primary care offices to provide the prescribers with support. And they often rotate to different ones depending on how many patients they have. Uh, these MAT teams are, I've been really impressed with the quality of the knowledge of these folks in the MAT teams. And patients transfer back and forth between the hubs and spokes. Okay, the, the study. Gain preliminary information, quantitative and qualitative, on the impact of participation in the hub and spoke and to assess the usefulness of the services to opioid users and to determine when and why people with opioid use disorders of Vermont avoid treatment or discontinue treatment prematurely, to determine the perspective of individuals in treatment on the most helpful and positive aspects as well as the least helpful and most challenging aspects of treatment, understand family members, significant others, perspectives on the strengths and weaknesses, and collect data on the extent to which the Vermont hub and spoke system is providing adequate access to care throughout the state. Um, we've collected quantitative data from 80 participants in treatment. Um, we collected uh, 40 patients in the hubs, 40 patients in the spokes, half male and half female in both. So we had 20 men, 20 women in the hub, 20 men, 20 women in the spokes. We collected them throughout the state proportional to, in the five regions when I was doing it, proportional to the population. So we have a good geographic spread. The patients were volunteers. We didn't do random assignment of collect or random selection of these patients. Due to the limitations of the budget, we needed to get our subjects as quickly as possible. So we hung flyers in all of these hubs and spokes, said if you'd like to talk to someone and participate in a study and earn $40 for your time, um, call this number here at UVM and we um, set up an appointment. I did all the interviews except for 20 and I had a colleague from UCLA who I've worked with for 40 years do the others So, because I wanted a consistency between my brain and the other person doing the interviews and this guy and I think exactly the same way. So um, it, the we both, uh, his name's Michael McCann, he and I have uh, talked to probably thousands of opioid users over the years. So we had a pretty good understanding of how to develop rapport and develop uh, a relationship quickly with patients to get them to talk about their experience. All of the subjects that we uh, had had been in treatment at least six months. We wanted our sample to have participated for a while. Now there's a whole other study on the dropouts, why people dropped out, and that needs to be looked at, but that's not who we studied in this study. Uh, we, and 40 on, uh, the patients in the hubs were methadone, on methadone, the patients in the spokes were on buprenorphine, and each uh, group was half male, half female. Now we did look at a small group of out-of-treatment opioid users that we recruited from flyers on the street and in the syringe exchange programs. Uh, and these 20 people, half male, half female, um, 10 of them have been in treatment and dropped out. The other 10 had never been in treatment. So we looked at these folks, we collected the same quantitative data from them, um, but we were just, we were interested in sort of why did they drop out of treatment? What happened? Were they, did they hate treatment? Um, are they never gonna go back to treatment? And why did these other folks not enter treatment? So we wanted a little sample of that, of that population. Uh, the way we collected the data is all retrospective. We asked patients a set of questions, and I'll show you the domains, about the last 90 days. In the last 90 days, how often have you done this, 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 collected all that information? And then we said, okay, the 90 days right before you entered treatment, let's go through those same questions for that time period. So we're going to talk about a 90-day period. You entered treatment 
in January of 2011. Okay, let's go back to 2011. The 90 days before you entered treatment, we're going to ask you about that stuff. And, and patients tend to remember what was going on immediately before they entered treatment. It tends to be a pretty big, important time in their life. So we compared those two 90-day periods for the in-treatment people. For the out-of-treatment people, since they weren't in treatment, we couldn't get the time point before they entered treatment. So we asked them the last 90 days, and then we said, okay, let's go back a year. So February 2nd of last year, the 90 days before that. Let's talk about what's changed over that 12-month period. So for the out-of-treatment people, uh, we did a uh, retrospective back 12 months. With all of the data, we used the timeline follow-back method, which is a way of trying to guide people's memory about what was going on during the last 90 days and what was going on during the 90 days before treatment or the 90 days before 12 months ago. So I hope that's clear. Okay, the assessment domains are these. By the way, all the data we're collecting is self-report. We debated doing urine testing. It uh, was a cost issue. And to be honest, there's some pretty good data supporting the value and the reliability of self-report data if the data are collected by somebody that doesn't have any contingencies over you. That is, they're not your parole officer or a police officer, or they're not your... Um, you know, your counselor who's going to take your take-homes away or something like that. So we felt, um, obviously, there are limitations to self-report data, and we cover in the report the uh, issues, the pros and cons of self-report data. These are the domains we assessed, drug and alcohol use in general, opioid use, injection use, education, employment, criminal justice involvement, family, health and healthcare utilization, uh, multiple areas of mental health functioning, opioid overdose, satisfaction with life. And then we asked patients about stigma and their sort of overall global measure of how effective they thought treatment had been for them. We looked at 24 other patients uh, where we did qualitative interviews with them. We sat down with them for an hour, we turned on a tape recorder, we went through a pre-set script of questions, um, and we uh, and again, this was half men, half, half women, half hub, half spoke. And uh, we did the same thing with uh, 12 family members of people who were uh, opioid users in Vermont. Uh, most of them in treatment, but some of them out of treatment. To get some sense of the family member's perception of the hub and spoke system. So that's what we did. And it breaks down into these cells and the, these... Uh, uh, the numbers of people in these categories that we talked to. We also called um, the uh, Vermont's uh, blueprint managers are the folks out in the field who uh, are work with the primary care docs and who organize the medication assisted treat and mat teams, and they're very aware kind of of what's going on in their region of uh, their geographic region. We called these folks and we interviewed, uh, I think there's 14 of them, and we interviewed 12 of them, uh, and we interviewed people from uh, 24 spokes uh, about how, is it, how easy is it for a patient to get into treatment out there in the spokes. Department of Health has data on the hubs. We had here in, in Burlington a big problem with their waiting list to get into the Chittenden Clinic. Well, recently, in the last six months, I think, through efforts of uh, many people here, uh, the waiting list is gone. But does that mean there actually is no wait to get into treatment? Because th that didn't really include the spokes. So we wanted to talk to people in the spokes about, if I'm a person living in Brandon and I want to get into treatment and I call uh, a spoke, what happens? I mean. Do they say come right in, enter treatment, or, or what exactly goes on? So we did these phone calls to get a sense of how access works in the state of Vermont. That was sort of like a little secondary project. Okay, here's, the, here's what we found. Our 80, um, or our 100 participants, our 80 in treatment and our 20 out of treatment, 
were uh, mean age of 37, uh, marital status, uh, education 12.5 years. Um, in the sample we interviewed, uh, we only had 22% who were employed full-time and 20 part-time. This was probably one of the limitations of, of our sample is that it was easier for people who were not working to participate in the study because the people who were working were at work. And um, we offered to come in at 6 a.m. to the uh, clinics and to the uh, set or in the evening, but we didn't get many takers from, and I think maybe the $40 incentive was more important to people who weren't working. So we got a disproportionately high rate of unemployed patients. But that's, that's who we got. 8% uh, were in school and 27% were on parole or probation. That, by the way, is a, uh, a low number. I don't know if it's representative of the entire population in Vermont. Populations I've, I've worked with in California, it's usually closer to 50%. So I think in Vermont, in part because the treatment has been so robust, we're seeing, I think, fewer of the people with addiction getting in, involved in the criminal justice system, which is a good thing, I think. And it, I see Chief Del Pozo's here, and I think he would agree with that, that um, if we can do something other than put them in jail that's more productive, it's, it's a better way to go for, for everybody. This is the, um, of course, this is an average, so this is not every patient individual doesn't go through this progression, but the, in, on average, uh, the uh, users started uh, their drug and alcohol and cannabis use at 13 to 14. This is a little bit unusual in that typically what we've seen is tobacco use starts first, then you'll get alcohol and cannabis about the same time, but we got all three at about the same time at about 13 to 14 years old. Little hallucinogen use, stimulants in the early uh, 20s, and prescription drug use about the same time, although a third of the opioid users had started before the age of 18. I mean, this is an average, but so there are some early starters, and I'm, I'm gonna go back and look at the data and see if there's anything unique or different about the early starters compared to the later starters. Um, they take prescription opioids for a while, f uh, five to six years, and then they switch to fentanyl heroin and start injecting at about the same time. So uh, that's their sequence. And then uh, more recent, most recently, they many of them, I think about a third, I've got the data in here somewhere, uh, bought, start buying uh, buprenorphine mostly on the street. Uh, and so they're able to, uh, in part because in some places, access was not available, the purchasing it on the street was easier than getting into treatment. Let me get the 20 out of treatment people out of the way first. Nothing changes. People don't spontaneously recover. They don't, uh, the 20, the data from 12 months ago to now are basically the same. They're using every day and they're still using every day. And they're committing crimes and they're still committing crimes and all the other stuff there. I mean, some of the data we got from these folks on their emergency room utilization was remarkable. The, in uh, the, uh, the highest rate of emergency room utilization self-reported by one of the participants was in the last 90 days, how many times you've been to the emergency room? And it was 35 times. Um, and so they're uh, part of the, you know, the, and this isn't overdose, this is for every, drug seeking. I mean, they're, they're going in to try to get prescription opioids for their, uh, for their addiction. But anyway, the, I've got some other findings from the out-of-treatment people, but basically, if, if you don't go into treatment, you're gonna to continue to use treatment or something, some other dire uh, thing will happen to you. This is the uh, data on opioid use for the treat in-treatment sample. Um, at the entry into treatment, people are using every day. That's different than with other drugs. For example, uh, I'm sure Steve remembers from the, the cocaine and methamphetamine days, they're often using about half the days. They'll use, in a 90-day in a period, they would have used 40 to 50 days out of that period of time. They typically use in binges, they stop, they use again. Opioid users use every day. 
And uh, so what we got, if you look at the, any opioid use, the average was uh, 86 days out of the 90 days pre-treatment, the blue bar. During the last 90 days, it drops to about three and a half days in the last 90 days. Now, I've done 30 studies on opioid users in a variety of different places and, and uh, contexts. I've never seen this kind of reduction before. This is very profound. They're, they're, the patients here, part of what I wanted to find out is how are they doing? Just sort of my own curiosity. They're doing very well, certainly in terms of their opioid use. Their prescription opioid use decreases. Their heroin and fentanyl use decreases. They're, obviously, they're not, if they're in treatment, they're not buying buprenorphine on the street anymore. And their injection rate drops significantly. So. It's, it's a positive story uh, on their opioid use. Percentage-wise, it's, it's a huge drop. Non-opioid use, uh, we see a little reduction in their tobacco use, although you're still seeing um, use of tobacco, even of the people in treatment, about two-thirds of the days, or that's more likely two-thirds of the people are still to smoking tobacco. Alcohol use drops significantly. Um, the only one that doesn't drop significantly is cannabis use. They continue to use cannabis at the same rate as they had pre-treatment. Um, hallucinogens, there isn't much of any. Cocaine use drops, sedative tranquilizer use drops, and uh, amphetamine use, which there isn't much of, also drops. So overall, um, you see very large decreases in their other drug use as well. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to happen from treatment with methadone and buprenorphine. They are designed to treat people for their opioid dependence, not for their stimulant dependence or uh, benzodiazepine dependence. But we did see uh, large drops, which probably are a result of not just the medicine, but the counseling and the context of treatment. Looking at it, in the last 90 days, percentage of patients reporting no opioid use in the last 90 days was 85% who, were, who said they hadn't used any opioids in the last 90 days. If you took opioids, cocaine, methamphetamine, and benzos, and said, how many of you have not used any of those, it was 62.5%, so about 60%. Now, if you talk to people who run methadone clinics, and you look at the data from opioid treatment, in a well-run clinic, you get about 60% of the patients doing very well. And that's about where we are here, although I think it's uh, the, the, the rate is actually better. This is over 90 days any use. So it's not everyday use, it's any use in the last 90. Then if you go down to add alcohol and cannabis, the percentage of patients who are only using tobacco, it drops to 30%. So 70% of the patients are not in what you would call sort of classic recovery, abstinence uh, recovery. They're still, most, many of them using cannabis uh, and some using alcohol and stimulants. And so there is some continuing use of drugs, but the target for this treatment is opioids, and that seems to have responded very well to the, the treatment available. Medical utilization, um, prior to um, entering treatment, during the 90 days before treatment, the average was about three and a half day, three and a half visits to the emergency room. So if you multiply that times 80 patients, you're talking about, you know, 250 visits to the emergency room for the cohort during the 90 days before they entered treatment. More recently, less than half a day of, or less than half a visit on average in the last 90 days. So they, they get out of the emergency rooms. That's a good thing. Um, overnight hospital stays, number of days, number of times in the hospital, that drops. And their contacts with a physician actually go up slightly because they're seeing the physicians for their uh, suboxone and methadone treatment. Overdose history, 25% had overdosed within the 90 days before treatment. In the last 90 days, nobody had overdosed out of the 80 subjects we talked to. These medications are protective for overdose. So 
if nothing else, getting people on methadone and buprenorphine will reduce the number of people who die from overdose, and um, which is a obviously good thing. Uh, criminal justice involvement. Uh, when I presented this down at the mayor and uh, uh, Chief Del Pozo's meeting, the, the police around the table were smiling at my 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 data, uh, asking them how many days did they do illegal stuff. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is what we got. Stopped by the police or arrested by the police uh, three times in the 90 days before treatment on average. Uh, after, uh, in the last 90 days, you know, less than half a, a time for on average. Uh, days incarcerated re was reduced. And when you ask them about days of illegal activity, and it, it's, you know, when uh, Mickey, the, uh, my colleague and I were asking him about this, we, we didn't just read the question and take the answer. We did a lot of probing about, uh, really, you were able to do, how, well, how are you buying whatever it is? You, need? you know, we, we did a lot of poking around and a lot of examining things to try to extract. And we, and we told the page, and we did a whole preamble about why this project really needs your most candid answers, because we want to improve the, the, the system. And so we really don't want, like, rosy success stories to, 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 for everybody to feel good. We really want to know what's happening with you. So we did try our best to get candid answers as much as we could. But this is what they reported on uh, days of illegal activity. It went from 30 days uh, pre-treatment to uh, a few days um, in the last 90 days. And so you see percentages of these things all reduced from time one to time two. Family conflict and mood states. We looked at uh, days of serious family conflict. Pre-treatment, uh, 35 or so days. More recently, 10 to 12 days. Um, days where you felt depressed, above, and we used the Beck depression scale above an eight or, or above a, a 16, I think, on the Beck depression. We got uh, pre-treatment. This is, of course, retrospective. Again, you're asking people how they were feeling during the 90 days before they entered treatment. Um, with depression, anxiety, and feeling angry or irritable, you saw significant uh, decreases. Again, and these are all percentage reductions. Satisf we used the um, uh, satisfaction with life scale on a variety of different scales. Their drug use, their satisfaction with work or school, their medical situation, family and social legal and emotional and mental health, all significant increases except the social, school or work situation. The, this 80 patients that we interviewed uh, didn't feel that they'd made much advancement there. And as you'll see in the recommendations for the uh, vocational services really were something they were asking they needed more for to help get uh, a deal with employment situation. And these are the scores showing improvements. There's a, a very brief scale called the Treatment Effectiveness Score that asks people in treatment, um, since you started treatment, uh, how much has your life improved? And they give a rating scale. And these are the percentage of people who scored above eight, which is very high, or it's a high rating. Uh, and here, we're comparing the red and blue bars are different. Here, we're comparing the hub patients with the spoke patients. All the stuff I've talked about before was both groups combined, and there was no difference between, on any of those measures between hub patients and spoke patients. And you could argue that either way. You could argue, well, that's surprising, because in the hub, they have specialists, intensive treatment. They have addictions, trained doctors. John Brooklyn is in most of them. Um, and you've got really uh, highly uh, trained staff to work with addiction. Out in these primary care clinics, these aren't addiction doctors. These are regular doctors who happen to be willing to try this and the MAT team to support them. So you could argue it's surprising the spoke patients are doing as well as the hub patients. Conversely, you could argue because of the use of a scale that John and Stacy Sigmund developed where they try to root the more severe patients into the hub and the less severe in patients into the spoke, that the spoke patient should be doing better. Well, the, with the sample we have of 40 and 40, which is not a huge sample, uh, but 
We didn't find any differences in anything between hub patients and spoke patients, except here. On their ratings of how they felt treatment, whether how effective they felt treatment was, they both felt, 80% of both groups, hubs and spoke patients, felt that their drug use, they were doing very well with their drug use, that they were highly uh, successful. However, on their health measures, their personal responsibilities, taking care of their kids, going to uh, work, doing uh, the things they're supposed to do, and community membership, which really gets at crime, uh, how much you're involved in continuing to commit crime, the spoke patients were significantly higher on all three of those. That is, their ratings were better. They felt they were, had done much better on those areas than the hub patients, although for, as far as drug use, they, they were equivalent, actually exactly the same. When we did the qualitative data, these are some of the themes that we got. The first one, and we didn't really even have to ask the question. I mean, the, the 80 patients we interviewed, and I should say these 80 patients are quite comparable, the data that we got and the information I got from them is very similar to 100 patients I did before I did the study that I went out and interviewed in hubs and spokes all over Vermont because, just because I was interested in, in finding out what they were doing. Uh, the, you hear this from, from literally all of the patients. They're extremely grateful that Vermont has made medication treatment available for them, that this is, uh, they talk to their friends in New York and their friends in uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire and other places, and they recognize that this is unique, what's going on here and that they got, they've gotten tremendous benefit from uh, the medication-assisted treatment, the medicine and the rest of the treatment components. Um, in going in the, uh, talking to the hub patients, they were, said the staff of the hubs, uh, much more so than the doctor in the hub, but the, the surrounding staff were uh, really their major contact with treatment and there were some positives and there were some negatives in that. Uh, the biggest negative being staff turnover. They would get introduced to a counselor, this counselor is going to work with you, and two weeks later the counselor would quit. And give them the, There was one patient who said she, she had seven counselors in a matter of six months, and that that was kind of not very helpful. She just said, I don't talk to them anymore because won't, they won't be there next week. Um, that was one of the biggest criticisms from patients in the hubs. But they also said that they felt the counselors and the staff were very supportive and useful, and so there were positive and negative. Um, the biggest negative we got in the whole project was the view by patients treated in the hubs that, the, the, that there was a depersonalized kind of treatment experience going and standing in line for your medication and in some of the clinics, particularly here in Burlington, the lines can be pretty long. And that when you're standing in line, there's a lot of discussion going on which is counter-therapeutic. Uh, there's selling of benzodiazepines. There's talking about crime. There's things that are going on. And, and I, I know, I, I mean, I spent several months at the, at the Howard Clinic. They have security guards, they have staff roaming around, they have people trying to reduce that kind of stuff, but it happens. Anytime you bring together hundreds of opioid users in the same place at the same time, even if 80% of them are doing well, 20% of them are not doing well, and they're not helping the other 80%. And so that dynamic was, um, we heard that a lot. Uh, from patients in the hub, that that experience, even though they thought the staff was good and they really valued the treatment, the experience of going for the treatment was for many of them a negative experience. In the spokes, the exact opposite, that they went to their primary care doctor's office, nobody knew they were an addict particularly, they were just there with all the other medical patients. They were called up to see their doctor for their appointment the same way the lady there for a prenatal visit was, gets called up. They go into the back, they see the doctor and the staff. They, they talked about what a great experience it was. And I think one of the things we're seeing in Vermont now is 
some of the patients we talked to who are out of treatment, when they're told to get into treatment, you have to start in the hub, and that's true in some places. They won't go to the, they don't want to go to the hubs. They want to go to the spokes. Uh, they really, the, the, the treatment experience is much more positive there. The lines in dosing are, are reviewed as being uh, not particularly helpful. And although they, uh, I said the counselor turnover was a problem and uh, participants, uh, they felt by going to these places, these hubs, which everybody in the community knows that this is where the opioid users go, that there was much more stigma involved in participation in treatment. The patients going to the spokes, not so much because they, they weren't going to an addiction place. They were just going to the doctor's office. Uh, for people in the spokes, um, they felt the medication was uh, very useful. Uh, they felt the environment was good for their self-esteem and their attitude toward treatment. And this is where we saw the stuff about the relationship with the doctor. This was like, uh, I wasn't really looking for this. This, was, this came from the patients that um, the relationship, and many of these patients on buprenorphine go in once every two weeks or once a month. And the doctor's not doing psychotherapy with them. The doctor is saying, hi, how are you doing? Uh, how's this going? How's that going? Maybe talking to them about some of their medical issues or some of their family issues. Visits are five or 10 minutes in many cases. That encounter was viewed as a very powerful encounter and a very positive encounter. And um, as I've sat in on 50 or so of those visits and different uh, uh, spokes with different doctors. It really is a remarkable thing to watch these, these uh, physicians interact with these opioid users. You know, I was trained to work with addicts. You gotta like do this and this and talk to them and expect they're gonna lie to you. These doctors are just talking to them like they're regular people, like they're actual, you know, your kids. I mean, they're, it's, it really is inspiring what uh, what Vermont has done with the, with the integration of this treatment into primary care, and the spoke patients really uh, gave us that message. They felt buprenorphine was uh, positive, and they felt uh, minimal stigma. Uh, we, inter we only interviewed 12 family members. Uh, they were less positive. About, they were, of course, very grateful that treatment e existed, and that their family member was able to get into a medication-assisted treatment, <clears throat> and they generally felt it had been pretty accessible to get people in. They were very disappointed that there were no services for the family members. There was nothing even to educate the family members about what is addiction, what is, what is likely to happen with my family member, the, uh, the patient, how long, what are these medicines he's, he, he or she is taking, and how long should they take them? And what, uh, they, so they really, there, the, there was a big criticism, and there were some who said they attempted to contact the clinic and were told, we can't talk to you because of uh, 42 CFR, uh, the confidentiality regulations. And they said, I didn't want to ask them how my sister's doing, I just wanted to learn about addiction. So I went online and I found some websites and I've learned it that way, but there was a criticism that there wasn't anything available for family members. And they, um, they also mentioned for their patients who were in hubs, that many times the patients came back and they had bumped into an old drug dealer friend and what was supposed to be a positive visit to continue their treatment had turned, sort of taken a left turn. And um, so there was that um, criticism as well. And they felt that uh, the patients who they were, who were in this medication-assisted treatment, many of the, or some, some of the family members felt they had other mental health disorders, and that it would be really helpful if they could get the mental health treatment at the same time they got the addiction treatment. When we asked the blueprint managers about access to treatment, they felt it was pretty good throughout the state. There are some areas um, uh, that they felt that for many of their uh, 80 or so, 80 to 90 uh, spokes, this treatment was becoming routine in the, in the primary care settings, that it was no longer a debate about should we treat people with opioid addiction in our clinic or not. It was just 
This is one more thing. We treat people for diabetes, we treat them for hypertension, and we treat them for opioid dependence. And that's now becoming sort of a standard. Um, and that that's a good thing. Um, they felt that, in, that some of the spokes were unnecessarily rigid in uh, this, the hub and spoke. There, there, there are some places in the state where all patients have to be admitted and inducted on to medication through the hub. They have to go to the hub, get stabilized, and then get referred out to the um, spoke. Well, many, there, there are many of the spoke doctors who have become very experienced with buprenorphine who now will admit patients directly into their practice. And the blueprint managers felt that should become more of the routine rather than having to funnel everybody because one of the things we would ask them was, and when we talked to the, to the sites, to the spoke sites themselves, how many calls do you get in a month for opioid treatment? 10 or 15, what do you do with them? We refer them to the hub. Do you have any idea how many of those patients actually enter treatment at the hub? No. Um, and do you, do you think, how many new admissions do you actually do in your spoke? Maybe two a month. So it's like if they get 15 calls and they admit two people that get back to them, it, I think there's a lot of people who are interested in accessing treatment, but because of this, uh, uh, some places, uh, the required hub admission, we're probably not maximally getting everybody into treatment. Um, and some of the spokes said that they had policies that uh, required people to wait a month before they admitted them to treatment for, then they didn't know the reason, but it was a policy. And I've run clinic and I know, I know how that works. People one day decide it's going to be a policy, and then no one ever knows where that came from. And um, so anyway, uh, Blueprint managers suggested more flexibility and urgency and rapid admissions would facilitate treatment entry. OK, uh, the methodological limitations. Sample sizes are underpowered. 40 and 40 hubs and spokes isn't really enough for a meaningful, statistical, robust comparison. Uh, patients were self-selected. We didn't randomly select patients from these different sites and ask people, ask the staff in this spoke to give us, you know, on their patient code, the number, people with number two in their, in their patient number or some other random way of trying to recruit. All the data self-report, we didn't do validation with urine tests. Uh, this is not a controlled research trial. The out of treatment group wasn't a true control group, obviously. It was just a sample to sort of get a sense of what's happening to those people who are not in treatment. And the sample results really need to be viewed in the context of all the other data being collected in Vermont. Uh, and in addition, uh, I have a recommendation that somehow we have to figure out how to do a prospective study using urine testing and using uh, more robust uh, research methodology. Um, I don't think I mentioned this, but when we talked to the 10 and 10, the, the people who were out of treatment, of that 20 patients, 15 of them were at the time, remember this is about a year ago we were doing this data collection, were on a waiting list or were trying to get into treatment. These 20 were not people who didn't want treatment. Even the, of the 10 who had been in treatment, eight of them were on a waiting list to get back into treatment. It wasn't as if they went into treatment, thought it was horrible and terrible, and never wanted to be in treatment again. They did, in fact, want to be in treatment and were waiting and trying to get, to get back in. Um, there, were, there were a few who didn't want to go to treatment for all the various reasons that um, uh, occur. But um, I think that the out of, if we, now that we've actually eliminated, for the most part, the waiting list, I think if we did some increased outreach, we could bring even a larger proportion of these folks into treatment uh, with a little bit of, uh, we could use some incentives. That would be a novel idea to bring them in. But uh, I think that you could, you could definitely increase, right? The, the level of number of people in treatment in Vermont has been fairly stable, I believe, the last two, three years at about 7,000. Beth, what is the, in three years, Okay, so the number now in the to total, the aggregate is, is 7,500 or so hubs and spokes. Okay, so it, it's, it, it's, it's around, I think that I, 
my best uh, estimate, and we've talked to the chief and others, and we had epidemiologists here, is there's probably 20,000 opioid users in Vermont, more or less. So I think we're about a third of the population in treatment. So I think we could push that up to a higher proportion if we did some things to really outreach uh, for more patients. So the um, conclusions. Medication-assisted treatment was associated with a large reduction in opioid use, substantial reduction in other drug use except cannabis, a substantial reduction in injection, reduction in uh, emergency department visits and overdose, a slight but not significant increase in education uh, and employment, um, a 90% reduction in days of illegal activity and contact with police, and a decrease in family conflict and an improvement in mood. Um, participants treated in the hubs uh, and those treated in the spokes responded very similarly to uh, medication-assisted treatment. Uh, both settings viewed the medicine as very treatment. Spokes viewed their uh, relationship with their doctors very, as, as very valuable and the spoke patients rated care as helping them to a greater degree in some domains than did hub patients. Family members were grateful and appreciative of the availability of treatment and, were, um, and expressed uh, that they would like to somehow be more involved in treatment. The recommendations we've made are that uh, we still, I think it would be useful to have smaller hubs. I think that part of the problem with the um, the sort of bad environmental stuff that happens in hubs is anytime you bring four or five, 800 people to the same place, it, you, you generate problems. So I, I think it would be useful. You can do it with either developing a full hub or a medication dispensing unit that is uh, where people go for their medicine. Uh, it doesn't have to be a full on methadone clinic, but I really think hub capacity could be uh, increased. Spoke capacity, um, more spokes, more doctors prescribing. There are places, Northeast Kingdom has uh, a relative shortage of prescribers. A lot of the buprenorphine patients there go to the hub, even though they would prefer to go to a spoke. Um, so that we, we still need more doctors to prescribe. The fact that UVM, internal medicine, I think, and family medicine residents are now all getting waivers as part of their treatment is an absolutely wonderful uh, development and uh, to the credit of UVM. Um, and I think many of the psychiatric residents are also getting um, uh, waivered. Um, the workforce plan, uh, obviously a lot of the clinics are there with the turnover and with the shortage of staff, there's often pl positions that aren't being filled and turnover of people. And I think we need a prospective evaluation of this with better, more rigorous uh, uh, data collection methods. Very quickly, recommendations. The mental health issue came up both with the family members and with many of the patients. That uh, About 40% described a history of mental health treatment, depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, attention deficit disorder. And they really felt it would be helpful to their addiction care if they could also be treated for their mental health care in the same place at the same time. And that was, um, that was a very uh, frequently heard issue. Vocational assistance would be useful. Developing a family member, significant other component would be, I think, a, a step in the right direction. Um, right now, when patients are in, on methadone or buprenorphine and they're using cocaine or benzos or uh, other drugs, there's really no protocols for how, what do you do with that. And there's actually good evidence-based information as to what could be useful with those patients to address their other substance use disorders, but none of that is being applied as far as I can tell. So I think that getting some additional protocols for those other disorders would be useful. Uh, tobacco cessation, I think, could be easily added as part of treatment, and we have a situation where 60 to 70 percent are still smoking. Uh, develop materials to... Um, uh, one of the issues that comes up that, that it, uh, comes up like all the time in clinical practice is, when should I get off the medicine? Families ask, patients ask, the patients often want to get off the medicine, but they don't know if they should or when they should, or and we don't really have a language for talking about that. Um, you know, generally the doctors will say, well, when you're ready. And they go, well, what does that mean? 
And there really is no, and, and actually, I think it's one of the areas NIDA has done a particularly bad job of, is helping talk about how to language that, to talk to patients about this. I mean, are we really saying that this is a chronic illness and they need to be treated as if it is, is a chronic illness? Probably. I mean, I have heard some doctors do a great job with it, and it's like hypertension, it's like diabetes. We, you, we need to like help you get your life in order, and, and you may be on medicine a long time. And, um, but there really isn't any help for how you deal with that issue. In California, we just had a, a meeting with the doctors there, and that question came up, and someone authoritatively said, well, they should be on for 18 months, no longer than two years. And it was, I mean, that, I don't hear that here in Vermont, although there are some docs who really push pretty uh, robustly to get people off the medicine. So I think that's an issue we still need to develop some language around. Um, there's, there's several documents that help place patients in hubs or spokes that uh, have been used. I think they could be tweaked a little more to get more patients in the spokes, because I think that would be a, a good thing. Uh, review and develop a uh, protocol for how do you deal with cannabis screening? There are doctors in Vermont who are discharging patients from that because they are positive for cannabis. Do we really want to do that? And I asked John Brooklyn about that. And he said, well, it's hard to tell doctors what they should and shouldn't do. But it would be nice to get some protocol standard guidelines for how to deal with that that don't include discharging them from treatment. And finally, um, there's a new uh, form of buprenorphine, a, a one-month injection that just came on the market, or it, I guess it's not exactly on the market yet. I think that would be very useful. Some of the patients who uh, I think could be used in the spoke or in the hub where they get an, uh, an, a depot injection of uh, buprenorphine that lasts for 30 days. They don't need to take the medicine every day. They can't sell the medicine. Uh, we could reduce the amount of medicine diverted onto the street, which is, um, you know, as we've talked about, uh, you know, it's, it's better if they're taking buprenorphine on the street than if they're taking fentanyl. But it's not exactly the way you would prefer to dispense your medicine by having addicts selling it to other med addicts. So, uh, and I suspect at some point the taxpayers in Vermont are going to say, well, hold it. They're using their insurance and getting their medicine and then they're selling it? I don't think I like that very well. So I think this depot form of buprenorphine could be a big step and I think it would be very helpful therapeutically for many of the patients. So um, the Vermont, um, that was, oh, there they are. Uh, Vermont's done good. Um, the, uh, I think that the, uh, Hub and Spoke is innovative. I think the Hub and Spoke is a very uh, positive uh, uh, development. I think the services and the model have saved many lives and has helped many Vermonters discontinue opioids and improve their lives. So to those of you who have been involved, congratulations for your effort and thank you. I haven't looked at that yet, but you're right. And um, unfortunately, I mean, in terms of, I mean, one of the demographics, Vermont's so white, it's hard to look at any kind of racial or ethnic differences in the outcomes. Uh, I think our sample was, as Vermont is, about 95% white, non-Hispanic. In terms of, I am interested, though, in the older ones versus the, the ones who started earlier, uh, the ones with less education. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll look at that, although, when you get these numbers, you got 80 patients, it's hard to slice them up too much and have enough 
meaningful comparison for that, but, but we, will take, we will take a look at, at those issues. I, my hunch, I mean, my colleagues at UCLA, Doug Anglin and E. Ying Sir, and, and ha, have done these 40-year studies of opioid users. And they were, Doug's work was the work that um, really helped give the foundation to the idea of addiction, opioid addiction as a chronic illness. Because when you follow patients over 40 years, opioid users, you only see about 20%, at least in the samples that UCLA studied, 20% that ever get as much as five years consecutively without either going to jail or relapsing to opioid. It is a chronic illness for most opioid users that have been studied. I think, optimistically, I'll never know because I won't live to find out in 40 years, but that the Vermont sample and the, this new cohort that we're seeing in the United States, not just Vermont, has a better prognosis than, partly because they got into treatment more quickly, and they have treatments like buprenorphine and, and um, buprenorphine particularly, but also methadone, and they got into treatment more quickly, and they didn't get themselves so much involved with the criminal justice system, and they are, many of them, employed. So I think that, but that, that's a study that needs to be done. Somebody needs to look at that and see how people have done over the trajectory of their, of their involvement. But I'm, I'm hoping that it'll be better, because I, I, I have to say, I mean, my nephew's in, involved with, with all of this. It's, and my next door neighbor had an overdose and their daughter died. So it's not like this is an abstract issue for me. The, uh, these, these opioid users, I mean, as you're well aware of this, I mean, these are your kids. These aren't some group of aliens that are over here in some part of town that nobody ever goes to and cares about. Not that those people aren't important too, but uh, I mean, this is a, a population that under any other circum historical circumstances in the U.S. would not be addicted to opioids. They, they tiptoed out into it because of these pills were available and they had no idea what they were getting themselves involved with. If you had only had heroin, injectable heroin, in 2005, and you were at a high school party and somebody said, hey, I've got this, you wanna try this? You wouldn't, many of these people wouldn't have crossed that line. But when somebody gave them a Vicodin or an Oxycontin, it was not viewed as that big a deal. So we have a lot of people who have gotten into this opioid thing that I think have many good skills and many resources, you know, education and those that, that may actually take our view of what is the prognosis of these patients and make it more positive. I'm hopeful. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Very excellent presentation of what seems like a very encouraging program. Somewhat related to the question of uh, how long people need to stay on medication. Uh, are the data on how long people stay in the, in the smoke and hunt system? Because uh, if they stay forever, <laughs> it can't accommodate, you know, all the, all the new possibilities. Then is, is there a possibility for people staying on the medication, if that field indicated, uh, but not as regular patients in the Exposed. Yeah, I think so, and I mean, I think that it, it's, it's, I mean, I think if you really, if you use the chronic disease model and you talk about patients going in and being on antihypertensives or, or insulin or other medications, you wouldn't think, well, we have to get these guys off so that these other people can get the medicines. You, primary care doctors treat chronic illnesses for as long as they need to be treated, and I think that uh, I, my, the, one young woman who I, I interviewed when I first came back who's been on buprenorphine now about nine years. She's on a low dose. She's uh, gotten pregnant and had two kids. She's uh, gotten promoted to the supervisor in her job. She's still, and I asked her, what's your thinking about this? Are you thinking you'll, she goes, my life is going so well, I don't want to mess with it. It's going well and you know, I've seen so many people get off and relapse and go back to using. I don't want to go through that, so I'm just going to stay on it for a while. So I think that that is going to become a, 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 a common thing, but I've also talked to some people who have gotten off and have continued to do well, but the pe m more of the people who have gotten off have recycled back into treatment. So I, I think that you will see more long-term treatment. Yes, sir. Rick, I'd like to... 
to emphasize some of your observations about the, some of the stigma of going to the hub. When we conduct our, our ethnographies of our clients, which I guess you call them interrogations, um, they, they, say, yeah. <laughs> they say the exact same thing. They say, number one, it's hard for me to get a job during the day because of the hours that I have to get there. Uh, the wait is long. Uh, we see it, I mean, it's not a secret that sometimes when we're looking to pick somebody up wanting for a crime, we just watch the line at the hub. It's not meant to scare folks away, but we just know it's that type of environment where um, you're waiting around, um, you're sharing information about uh, drug lifestyle or criminality, and you feel like everyone's looking at me and they know I'm an addict. So I think that's a serious concern. Um, and if we can change that environment in a way that makes it less of a stigma, you know, that, that would be great. The other thing I, I, I was wondering if you can expand on is, is you generally, but also the promise of, of, of the depot injection. Um, it, it, it's really captured. So first of all, I was talking to the prosecutor uh, yesterday, in fact, about we rarely charge for diverted buprenorphine, but we were thinking of studying making that a formal policy just to encourage people if they want buprenorphine, we're not coming after them for it because it seems so efficacious both in a structured setting and then also just in an unstructured setting. So I guess my question is, you know, looking at some of Stacey's research just on the waiting list for 12 weeks with no other support except you, you get something like 70% of yeah. abstinence. So, and those are folks that are not committing crime, right. they're not uh, uh, um, overdosing, right? I mean, the, the protections of safe injection leave when you leave the site. The protections of a depot injection last 30 days after you get the injection. Right. So what's the research we're thinking about just, just really like low, low, low barrier of buprenorphine, especially in depot form? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think, uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, the um, I'm a psychologist, I'm not a physician, so I don't prescribe medication, but I have to say, in, in my experience with this and in the data on buprenorphine and behavioral treatment requiring three time a week counseling or return, nobody's been able to show that that adds anything, that the medicine does much of the impact. That, and so I think that in many of the spoke patients now who have been on for a while and the doctor feels that they've, they're doing well, I mean, they go to once a month visits now. And, uh, and I, there are some people, I don't know what the protocol is, or, but there, I've talked to several patients who go in once every three months. They don't. So I think that you're going to see things move in that direction because of capacity issues and that getting as many people onto these medications as possible. Now, the, the, the problem or the possible concern is there is that segment of patients who need more than just the medicine. And we need to make sure that services for them are available, mental health services and behavioral services and help with their kids and all of that stuff, and so that it doesn't move slide in way in the other direction where this is just going to be a medicine clinic and there's no other services available. So, I mean, I think that many of the uh, spoke uh, settings in Vermont are sort of working out uh, that, that, that paradigm. And I think once the injectable medicine becomes available, uh, you'll see even a, a, an increase in that kind of an attitude. Yeah, just by, by way of very quick follow-up, what comes to mind for me is that police love coarse and imperfect, but, but generally effective interventions when it comes to dealing with you know, a robbery pattern or shooting, you know, spade shootings. We know that like some of our interventions, like deterrence or case investigation will be coarse and imperfect, but they'll be effective. I worry about the perfect, like clinically in, in the medical world, the perfect and the enemy of the good. Right. When you think of just at the height of HIV, raining condoms from the sky was a coarse <laughs> and imperfect intervention that, that really did help. There was a stigma, oh, you're just condoning the type of behavior that spreads AIDS. But no, once we got over that stigma, it worked. Narcan, you can't give it to people. You have to have a prescription. There's going to be Narcan parties. Now we're doing the equivalent of bringing the Narcan. <laughs> what an awful thought, a Narcan right, right. party. It's, yeah. it's, 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 yeah. And it's helping. So I wonder if we can get over that stigma or that hesitation with you. That's all well, I think we're moving in that direction. Yes, Steve. Right. Um, so I'm with that um, depot view. I mean, that's like a godsend in my mind. And we know enough. I, I, I know we don't have the trials on that. Right. But we know enough about the psychopharmacology of these depot preparations and opiate dependent populations to know that that could be really terrific. 
I talked to patients when I was in Los Angeles. Walter was, Ling was involved with many of the trials for these medicines. And you talk to the patients who get a depot, so they, they get one injection and then the, it maintains a blood level for 30 days. And they talked about getting up in the morning and not having to think about taking something. And it was the first time in 20 years they, that was the case. So I think in addition to the benefits of their being on the medicine, they're not gonna overdose, they're not gonna commit crimes, I think it has a therapeutic effect in the whole behavioral pattern of taking something for, to make yourself feel better. And they, they talked about that's how they always thought it would feel to be normal. And um, so I agree, I think, it's, I think it's a big step forward. Yes, sir. Last question. When I meet with families in community settings, um, some of the questions have to do with educating them. Tell me more. A lot of it is the nitty gritty of how do I deal with, how do I get my son into treatment. It, do you have a recommendation on how to work with families? Is there a protocol? Is there a syllabus? What, what in your talking with families and families want? Well, the ones that I want was. Uh, I mean, the ones I deal with informally who call me and send me emails asking for help, that's, the, I just got one yesterday. My son's in Austin. He overdosed and was just got out of the hospital. His father, he's 17. Where can he get him into treatment? And um, I have to admit, after being doing this for 45 years, I still don't know the right answer to that. Um, now, here in Vermont, I mean, I, when I was in Los Angeles, the, uh, the daughter of the, the girl I took to the prom at Otter Valley in 1966, her daughter was addicted to opioids. She contacted me in um, California and said, this was about 2007, what should I do with my daughter? I don't know what to do. I said, find a buprenorphine prescriber in Vermont. See if you can. And that's the girl I just mentioned who's been on for 10 years and has uh, two kids and is a supervisor at her job. And um, so Vermont, with opioids, I would, I would certainly direct them to whatever clinic you are aware of that will accept patients into treatment and put them on uh, medication. If, if. So I, that's one of the places. Now, with other substance use disorders, well, I'd send them to day one if they had uh, a stimulant and, or other or didn't want to be on medication or resistant to it. But uh, it, it is a tough, I, I don't know of a good, David Sheff wrote a book called Clean, and it, it has a lot of good information. David and I worked together because his son was addicted, and he went through the whole, where do I send him? What, 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 you know, where should we? And we, he, he wrote a book basically on his experience with that. And he also wrote a book called Beautiful Boy, which is about his son's addiction. Both of those books are really good sort of processing of how you figure out what, how to get your family member into treatment, what to say, what, and what things will be useful. So I would look at, those are good resources, but they're not what you're asking for, which is a, some kind of online course of, for family members on how to deal with an addicted uh, family member. Be very useful. All right, well, thank you very much.